Tonight on KQED Newsroom, California is at odds once again with the Trump administration on key environmental regulations. And the San Francisco School Board votes to preserve a controversial mural at George Washington High School. Plus, more proof that facial recognition software is unreliable. We'll talk to the assembly member who authored the bill to ban it further in the state. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Brian Watt. We begin our show with the battle over protecting the environment and climate change. This week, the Trump administration made new rules to weaken the Endangered Species Act. The act is a landmark environmental law signed in 1973 by President Richard Nixon. It currently protects more than 1,600 plant and animal species facing extinction in the United States. California's attorney general quickly vowed to fight the Trump administration's move in court. And the very next day, California joined 29 states and cities in a lawsuit against another Trump rollback of environmental regulations, Obama-era restrictions on coal-burning power plants. It's been a very busy week for KQED science reporter Kevin Stark, who joins us, and Dan Kamen, energy professor with UC Berkeley. Welcome. Thank you. So, Kevin, let's start with the Endangered Species Act change. What is at stake for California when the federal government moves in to make a change like this? This is a huge deal, and it's a big deal for the state of California. So these rules have kept a lot of big species alive, the California condor, the grizzly bear, the humpback whale. But a thing that doesn't get talked about enough is how much this will impact the ecosystems of California. Mm. And we actually have more plants on the endangered, endangered species list than we do animals. It's a huge deal, and um, California has has more endangered species than any other state besides Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Additionally, half of our land is government land. A lot of that is federal. So that means that even though California might have strong laws, you know, um, a lot of the places in the state aren't covered under, under, the, under these um, protections that we have. Dan, one thing that really bugs critics about these changes is that they will allow government officials to ignore threats to species from climate change. Has climate change been an important factor in determining whether a species needs to be on this list? It hasn't historically been, but now that climate change is very much with us in terms of fires and drought seasons and even the ranges of species having to move up to higher elevations, it is now very central to the process. And there's even a second feature, which is as disturbing, and that is that this rollback would actually allow an economic assessment to be part of the assessment of a species. And that's never happened before because wolves and humpback whales don't vote and they don't have an earnings. And so what we're seeing is bringing in a criteria which is irrelevant to the biodiversity conservation side as a way to move in on lands and really disrupt ecosystems and these keynote critical species even more. I noticed that in rolling out these changes, the Trump administration said it wants to make the Endangered Species Act more efficient. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross said that, quote, the goal is to ease the regulatory burden on the American public, end quote. Are ranchers, loggers, what is the regulatory burden and who's feeling it? Yeah, there really is no regulatory burden. This is really an effort to make the Endangered Species Act endangered itself because we have a very clear set of rules that ranchers, landowners, local and state governments, and the federal government all look at to determine how endangered a species is and what are the ecological ranges we need to preserve. So this is truly a smokescreen for a desire to give away additional land for logging and for drilling for oil and gas and really to throw out one of the landmark pieces of legislation that has actually brought a number of species back and ironically has made a number of ecosystems more resilient, more healthy, healthy for humans and healthy for animals. Hmm. Kevin, let me ask you what California could do, is doing. Clearly, it's not afraid of going to court against the Trump administration. But as you mentioned, we have our own very, very strong laws with regard to environmental regulations. 
what what's California up to aside yeah. from going to court? Well, Dan mentioned that wolves don't have a vote. Animals like that also don't monitor by the same state boundaries that we do. So, you know, the wolf, which is protected, just came down from Oregon. You know, it could walk into another state. The California's protections don't extend there. The same, same thing goes for the clean power plan. You know, we're part of a regional grid system, so states around us might be burning coal. We know that power could be coming into the state. So even though we have really strong protections, it doesn't mean, like, these are, these are big issues, global issues. It doesn't mean that our protections are, are really going to protect the endangered species, and additionally, uh, climate change is a global problem. You know, this is something that um, isn't going to happen from Sacramento. It's not going to happen within the boundaries of California. Let's talk now about the lawsuit that California, 21 other states, and some cities filed this week against the Trump administration regarding regulating coal plants. Dan, help us understand the difference between how the Obama administration was doing it and how the Trump administration wants to do it. So the Obama Clean Power Plan sets each state to reduce its emissions by a third by 2025. And a particularly brilliant feature of that requirement is that it doesn't compete those states that have already made a lot of progress, like California or New York, against states that haven't started. It says you reduce from your own baseline. And that reduction, that one-third by 2025, puts us right on about the path we would need to be on to meet the intergovernmental panels of climate change's goal. The plan that now President Trump is proposing would have emissions go down by a roughly 1 percent. So it's a night and day difference. And the real irony of it is that states have already launched a number of the measures that would be needed. So some traditional coal states like Kentucky have actually discovered that by choosing the more efficient mixtures of natural gas and some renewables, they're actually ahead of schedule to get there from day one. Mm. And so it was a very thoughtful, very integrative plan. And the Trump one is literally just a mess. It just simply says, do nothing. Now, what California has done is to go considerably further. Our goal for 2030 is actually to be 60 percent powered by renewables, so far above that level. But what we've seen around the country is that the mixture of the low cost of renewables, the greater job creation in the renewables field compared to fossil fuels, and this opportunity to now sell clean power to the big economies like New York and California that want to buy that and are not buying not only coal but also natural gas really was an economic win around the country. So what the president's proposing is really retrograde environmentally and just quite frankly stupid economically. So the lawsuit that California and the other states have filed argues that under Trump administration policy, the Environmental Protection Agency essentially fails its mandate to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Kevin, are we really talking about an eventual clash in the courts over what the responsibility of the EPA is? Absolutely. And that's why we're seeing all of these lawsuits happen right now, is because the Trump administration wants to get this going in the courts. They want to get this in front of the Supreme Court, which is friendly to them, and they want to have it done before the end of the first term, because this is all executive action, which means if there is a new president in 2021, they can come in and, and, um, and just roll it all back. So they want to try and, try and get this solved, get this, this legal debate done before uh, the end of the term. I want to ask both of you what your sense is of if this were suddenly before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court as we know it today. Neither of you are law professors, but what is your sense, Dan, of how the Supreme Court would think about this regulatory battle? So the key issue in the EPA under Obama was the finding that carbon dioxide is a pollutant. And that's the legal structure for which these actions turned. Even with this more conservative court, I actually think that most of the justices are also fairly sensible human beings and will not take this retrograde Trump move. That doesn't mean all of them will, and there are certainly a few that have voted very conservatively. But the mixture of the action towards a cleaner economy, the social benefits of that and the sense that we are now the only country that is not finding 
greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide as a pollutant. I think this would still stay where we are, but as the court shifts, all bets can be off. Kevin, yeah, very quickly. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And I would say that beyond that, uh, the Obama's Clean Power Plan also said that carbon emissions hurt public health. So it, it's something that, that the smog uh, hurts uh, people that are living in this country. A lot of people that are low income living around coal plants, living around industrial. So that's a piece of this. Also, there's sort of two places that the lawsuit could end up, either Supreme Court or a panel of judges in the D.C. Circuit Court. The panel of judges in the D.C. Circuit Court might be more sympathetic to the arguments that uh, states like California are making. KQED science reporter Kevin Stark, Dan Kamen of UC Berkeley, thank you very much, both of you. Thank, thank you. you. There has been national outcry this week over the San Francisco School Board voting to hide and not destroy the controversial mural at George Washington High School. The mural was painted by artist Victor Arnatoff in the 1930s. It depicts Washington slaves and white settlers stepping over a dead Native American man. Back in June, the board was leaning towards painting over the mural. Those against the mural say the images are offensive and depressive, and students should not be faced with seeing them every day, while historians and mural supporters counter with the importance of preserving history and art. But now the decision has left both sides disappointed. Joining me now from Pasadena is KQED arts and culture reporter Chloe Veltman. And here in studio, board member of San Francisco's American Indian Cultural Center, Ariana Anton Ramirez. Hello to you both. Hello. So Hi, Brian. let me start with you, Chloe. A lot of people think this mural should not be seen every day, but a lot of people don't think it should be destroyed either. Can we start by going back to the original intentions of the artist who painted the mural? Sure, Brian, but I think first of all, we have to talk about the fact that it's challenging to consider questions of artistic intentions, that they're relevant to this story. Um, there's a lot of people who are, in set, who are saying that it's actually more important to think about the fact that we experience art, each of us subjectively, in the moment and our experience of art is always very closely connected to our the time and place that we are living in today mm. and mm. of course it's especially important when you think about the fact that this particular art is being considered decades removed from when the artist created it but to answer to your question we do know a little bit about Victor Arnatov's um, intentions from his biographer uh, Robert Cherney and it's it's a case that Cherney says that the artist never intended this mural as a racist work um, he wasn't intending to celebrate the achievements of white settlers. His aim with these richly vibrant frescoes depict, depicting these subjugated Native Americans and, and, and African Americans was to show the dark and disturbing side of colonial rule in this country. Mm. So mm. was this mural controversial from the beginning, from when it, when it was painted and presented there at the school? Not really from the very start. It's true that for decades, the school board and the board of education have been receiving complaints from students, from teachers, and um, talking about how disturbing these murals are. But um, the, the the sort of the response to them has ebbed and flowed over the years. Um, back in the 1960s, the Black Panthers got involved when the uh, African American School Union uh, wanted to have the murals removed. And and uh, the response to that was that they commissioned an artist in the Bay Area, Dewey Crump Crumpler, to create a response mural mm. uh, celebrating the achievements of minority communities. Um, and that mural is actually still around today. And Dewey Crumpler is somebody who has spoken out in favor of keeping these murals. So, um, but then, so, but that the creation of the Crumpler murals seemed, at least at the time, to assuage the. Um, the negative feelings that that community felt, at least to a degree. Right. And then uh, now we have the, the more recent time here where things have really flared up again as of last year with students and teachers and parents and other community members coming forth and wanting to have the mural removed. Ariana Antone Ramirez, not only on the board of the American Indian Cultural Center in San Francisco, but also an alum of San Francisco Public Schools. Were students complaining about this mural when you were in high school? 
Yes, and I remember myself being upset by this mural when I saw it at Washington High School. Um, just because I didn't go to Washington, I went to Galileo High School, that's where I graduated in 2016. Doesn't mean I never saw the mural in person. Um, I went to Washington for sports, for other things, so I've been to the school, I've seen it, and I remember thinking, why does one of my ancestors look like a decoration right here while they're dead in this mural? Mm. That To me, that doesn't seem like something that should be decoration. And so um, I've been an active participant in San Francisco Unified School District's Indian Education Program since forever, <laughs> for a very long time, part of my life. So like, we've had students coming to us and saying, we don't want this here. We have current Washington High School students who are black and indigenous telling us that they don't want that there because they don't feel like that's empowering them. It hurts them, it traumatizes them to see that in their school every day. Because at the end of the day, this mural is in this lobby as a decoration. It's art that's decorating the lobby of Washington High School. And I don't think my genocide is decoration. Does anyone, is there ever a moment when a student passes by this mural, is offended, but then learns that in fact the mural in, fa in fact wants to attack slavery, even sort of call out the fact that Native Americans, there was a genocide that sort of led to a destruction of a culture to build America up. I mean, does, does that help at all? Does that ever do anything to change a mindset for students who pass by the mural? Well, what I think what people have to understand is that it's not being talked about right now with context, with historical context about what people are saying the artist was trying to do. That's not brought up. It's just there, no context, no plaque, no nothing telling what the artist is trying to do, no talking about it. So, like, people are saying it's this great teaching tool, but it's not being used to teach. So if that's the intent and if that's what people want to preserve it for, put it in a museum. But it doesn't need to be decoration. Mm -hmm. This mural is in a school, and so people will make the case for it being an educational tool. Clearly, you don't think it's explicit enough in sort of stating that with the presentation of the mural. But Chloe, who is in favor of keeping the mural, and what are they saying about why they want to keep the mural? There's quite a range of people who've come out in favor, um, including some students um, and uh, other members of the school community, not everyone from the school community wants to see it removed. Also, some prominent members of the African American community, including the president of the NAACP here in San Francisco, and the actor Danny Glover, who's been very public in vocalizing his support of keeping it. I mean, precisely because they want, they don't, they're saying it shouldn't be literally whitewashed over, that uh, this is an ugly truth about this country and it should be there and it should be a teaching tool. Hmm. Um, then there are the art preservationists and art critics who are sort of talking about its aesthetic value or um, it, that it is a beautiful and very vibrant work um, and to destroy it would, would be a, a terrible thing they say uh, in terms of art history. So it will be covered but not destroyed. Let me ask you, Ariana, first, does that satisfy you, it being covered but not destroyed? It does not satisfy our community because we are pretty sure that in 20 years or some point down the line, we're gonna come back and be having this same fight all over again. Another school board could vote to take those panels down. Panels are not a permanent solution. Those can come down. And I mean, it's been covered in the past before. The school board has talked about how they've covered it before. Right now it's uncovered. So clearly that happened already. And I would not be surprised if we come back and those panels are coming down. Chloe, I don't imagine that uh, the option of covering it but not destroying it satisfies the people who wanted to preserve the mural either. Am I correct? That's right. There's uh, been a lot of talk, particularly in the art preservation community, about how really the whole decision of the board right now is a bit of a lose-lose for everyone. Um, so, I mean, there are various different options around, you know, obviously painting over it would destroy it completely, take it away from po ever possibly it being a, a learning or teaching tool. Um, covering it up uh, is quite an expensive solution. And again, 
doesn't really help at all because yes uh, the work could be on display again in 20 years which would upset the students and then for the art, art people who want to see it it doesn't help either um, there is another solution that would be probably very very expensive and difficult to do but i gather not impossible from talking to experts it's been done at harvard university and it's a case of sort of surgically removing this mural um, and, and then taking it away and possibly putting it in a museum. Now, you know, I think any attempt to bring this up has been met with, well, it would probably cause structural damage to the, uh, to, to the school building itself. So it, it's probably unviable, plus very expensive. All right. But a potential option, if a donor were to step forward, uh, perhaps a large artistic institution, then maybe it's a possibility. KQED arts and culture reporter Chloe Veltman joining us from Pasadena. Thank you. Ariana Anton Ramirez of the American Indian Cultural Center of San Francisco, thank you for joining us. This week, some California lawmakers had to face a difficult reality. Their faces look a lot like those of suspected criminals. The lawmakers learned this when the ACLU of Northern California tested a facial recognition technology by running the photos of 120 legislators through a database of thousands of mugshots. The technology, an Amazon product, mistakenly found the faces of 26 lawmakers among the mugshots. The ACLU's message in running this experiment and publishing the results, with errors like these, facial recognition technology is not ready for its close-up. Assemblymember Phil Ting was among the lawmakers falsely identified among the mugshots, and he joins us now to discuss this. Hello, welcome. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. So I want to talk about the legislation that you are pushing on this, but I have to ask first, were you prepared to learn that your face looks like that of a criminal? Absolutely. The ACLU did the same test with members of Congress, and 28 of them were misidentified. So we thought it would be interesting to do the same thing with members of the state legislature. So a higher percentage of us actually got hit. It was 26 out of the 120. And were all the legislators willing to participate, actually have their faces submitted to this, or is that the, part of the experiment, too? You, you know, our, our portraits are public you know, on, are on public websites, so they just took the public portraits and cross-checked that against the different mugshots. Got it. So what does your legislation that you're trying to get through do on this? So AB 1215, it sets it, sets it up perfectly, where AB 1215 bans facial recognition software from body cameras. I did body camera legislation last year to have more transparency and openness because body cameras, as they were deployed, are really about making sure we're building trust between communities and law enforcement so that we actually have a public record of what happened during a particular incident. So by banning facial recognition software, it's ensuring that those cameras continue to build trust rather than surveil the community. This would be like deploying thousands of cameras with 24-hour surveillance. A lot of the knock on facial recognition technology has been that people of color seem to be at a higher risk, maybe even gender issues too. But um, are, are you finding that the more you learn about facial recognition technology, do you know why it is that communities of color might be more at risk of being misidentified? We don't know why, but for some reason, communities of color end up having a higher percentage of being mismatched than other people. Hmm. So for some reason, we don't know all the different reasons. The software, again, the software is still in its infancy. This software is not ready for prime time. Axon, the largest maker of body cameras, publicly came out and told people, we don't think facial recognition software should be in our body cameras. We're not going to put it in our body cameras. Microsoft refused to sell it their facial recognition software to a unnamed California law enforcement agency. So again, very rarely do you see corporations argue against their best interests, but they're, they're Americans too. And in America, we've had plenty of times where we debate between freedom and liberty versus public safety. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, we choose freedom and liberty. We, we could live in a safer society, but we've chosen not to live in a police state. The mayor of Beverly Hills wrote you a respectful letter opposing your legislation. He said, 
these technologies help compare images of hundreds of thousands of people quickly, this is important. It saves time, it saves resources, and particularly in a city like his, where there are high profile events, celebrities passing through, this is helpful technology. What do you tell mayors, law enforcement officials who really want this as a tool? I think it's a great point. In San Francisco, we probably have even more high-profile events than in Beverly Hills. And as a city, we've taken a position to ban even more types of facial recognition software being deployed in different types of things, uh, much more so than body cameras. My legislation is only regarding body cameras. So if they wanted to use that database in that software for some other purpose, my legislation does not preclude that. That's how I would say that. Um, in particular, in Beverly Hills, the question is, is, or any other city, how many innocent people are gonna get falsely accused or arrested? Once you are falsely arrested, that stays on your record unless you go through a number of hoops to go get that removed. That could impact your ability to get a job, impact your ability to get housing, impact your ability to adopt children. There's so many different ways that just a false arrest could impact your life. Amazon has stood by the technology saying that when a human uses it as one factor in a decision, it can serve beneficial purposes. Do you see a place where one day this technology could be put to good use? I, I think it's totally possible. Our legislation is being proactive. There's no law enforcement agency using this software right now. Uh, like all legislation, that is always up for debate at a later date. And I, I welcome that when that software is, is ready for prime time. Maybe we could have that discussion about how it could be used. But again, we, we see the downside of this. Uh, you saw all the protests in Hong Kong that are going on. The Chinese government is using facial recognition software to identify protesters. So imagine if you are out there exercising your free speech rights at a protest here in the United States. Do you really want to be uh, identified by the police for just exercising your basic civil rights? So again, this is ultimately a civil rights question and whether we want to continue to be a free and open society or whether we really want to have it much more closed and lose a significant amount of our privacy. Assemblymember Phil Ting, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. And that's going to do it for us. As always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom. I'm Brian Watt. Thanks for joining us.